So one question we get is, is this whole thing a joke? And the title is kind of jokey, but the, the design isn't. So I thought I would talk a little bit about it. Let's start with draws. Let's say that I came up with a completely new competitive game, like a new eSport or something. And I told you that uh, when experts played this game, they draw more than 60% of the time. So, so more than 60% of the time, neither player would win after playing uh, the game that, that took like an hour to play. So that would be, uh, that would be a major problem. <laughs> and uh, that's a problem that chess actually has. Uh, there's, a, there's another issue that's way more minor, and I understand that, but it, it's worth mentioning that um, in chess there's end games that are, that are completely solved, and so with a certain piece configuration, you know, 10 moves ahead or 15 moves ahead, you will definitely lose. Uh, so that's a little frustrating to beginners because you've got to memorize that. It's like a memorization tax to learn to learn this end game where there's, there's no thought in it. There's no... Uh, strategy involved. It's just purely uh, recognizing that, that it's a certain end game and, and executing the, you know, the, the predefined moves. And experts, they already know all this stuff, so they would just concede and not even play it out, which is okay, but it's just a little anticlimactic. I mean, you, you kind of hope that the game really ends when it ends and not uh, 10 or 15 moves ahead of time. So the midline rule in chess 2 addresses both of those things. It practically eliminates draws, and it means the end of the game is, is really the end of the game. So it works pretty well. Uh, the next thing I wanted to mention is bidding. Uh, I actually want to tell you three things about this bidding system. So first and most obviously is it, it introduces a little bit of yomi, a little bit of uh, reading, the mind, the, reading the mind of the opponent. And you know, some people don't like that, but uh, I, I think it's kind of good that if you uh, if you know what the opponent's going to do, that you are able to get some advantage off that. I mean, I think you deserve it. And you don't really have that element in uh, a game that has uh, complete or perfect information uh, like chess does. So I think it's it's kind of cool to, to add that element. Uh, but there's two other things that have nothing to do with reading the opponent at all that that bidding system does. We talked just a moment ago about how you don't really have to memorize endgame uh, sequences anymore because of the midline rule, but because of the bidding system, you don't really have to memorize book openings either. I mean, the, the, the number of possibilities of openings is just ex explosive. It's just there's so many more when you factor in all the different quantities of uh, bidding stones that each player could have at each, each point in, in time. It's, it makes book openings impractical, but really the most important thing. I think I think way more important than either of those two things we just talked about uh, that it does is that it emphasizes it emphasizes valuation. And valuation is one of the core skills of chess. Uh, what I mean by that is like uh, as a general rule of thumb, a pawn is worth one point, a bishop and knight is worth three points, a rook is five points. But that's just a rule of thumb. It, like at a specific point in a specific game those values change, and maybe this bishop right here is worth more than three points because it's really threatening. It's really important right now, and if you were able to trade with it for, for a knight that was worth supposedly three points, you definitely should, um, you know, because you've recognized correctly uh, how valuable the pieces are in that situation. So what the bidding system does is it allows uh, a player who is better at this core skill of valuation really push that advantage and really turn the screws on an opponent who's who's worse at that. Uh, you can make the, the opponent waste their, their bidding resources by, by misvaluing which which battles on the chessboard were more important. Um, and then the the kind of third big topic of, of chess 2 is uh, that it's asymmetric. So there's six different armies. Uh, and I've played uh, symmetric games and asymmetric games, and, and I have to say that the asymmetric games... Uh, there's just so much going for them. There's so many more dynamics going on, like with six uh, races or six armies, that's 21 different matchups. Uh, and learning all the, the nuances of those matchups and, and debating them and figuring out you know, how to play well in them and developing new techniques from them, it's just really interesting. Uh, and another thing that asymmetric games have going for them is that the... The, the game system that has these 21 matchups is really complicated. That's a, that's a lot to take in and, and learn, and yet 
you don't have to learn all of it. You don't have to play all 21 matchups. In fact, that would be weird to do at a high level. You really just need one race, one army, and to learn all of its matchups. So you, you get to only learn a fraction of the game and yet participate in this uh, interesting, big, diverse game. So I uh, hope you enjoy it.